this offering. Um, my roommate in college believed that God spoke to him in billboards. And at the time, Nike had released its Just Do It campaign. So, uh, and we lived, uh, went to school in Boston. So, you know, the subway rides, we'd see a lot of signs that say, just do it, just do it. And he'd say, Elliot, I, I need you to pray for me. I'm not too sure if I should take this job or not. And he'd go on the subway and just do it. So he'd do it, he'd take the job. He would, I don't know whether I should date this girl or not, just do it. So he would date that girl. And, and that was, he really truly believed, if you're watching Glenn, he truly believed, I don't know if you remember, but God was speaking to him through billboards. Now, it wasn't just the Nike commercials or, or advertising campaign that would speak to him, but he had numerous uh, uh, campaigns that would give just the right word that seemed to answer his prayers. Well, uh, it's an interesting thought, how does God speak to us? God speak is one of the heresies. Uh, that's prevalent in our communities and in our nation and our world today. The fact that people forget how God speaks to them. And it's important for us to go over this to make sure that you know and understand how God speaks to us. You should all know that God does use other people, circumstances, dreams and visions, often forgotten about. The Holy Spirit speaks to us, but most of all, his word, right? The Bible speaks to us. It reigns supreme among this list. Now notice, I am talking about the different ways that God speaks to us. And I list a number of things up there. Other people. Well, there's a qualitative difference between being spoken to by God by your non-Christian uh, professor at college and your pastor that you've known for 20 years. There's a qualitative difference. Who do you think is God's going to use to speak to such a person? A student, away at school. Would they listen to their professor or would they call their pastor, their Sunday school teacher, their parents? Would they call? Oftentimes they believe that they're hearing the word of the Lord from an unsaved source. Now I'm not saying that God can't use an unsaved source, but... You have to consider that. Circumstances. Well, all sorts of things can, can come about in our lives. And you can think that God seems to be telling you to do something. We've all been in that situation. We've wondered whether or not God is asking us to do this or that or the other thing because of the circumstances. A lot of times God does use circumstances. But just because certain things happen doesn't mean that that's necessarily God speaking. You, can you think of somebody from the Bible who used circumstances to determine God's will? How about Gideon and his fleece, right? He did a double-blind study, sort of, not technically, but he did have his fleece. And he had it one way one night, he had it the opposite way the other night, just to make sure that God was speaking to him through the circumstances of the fleece in the morning when he woke up, whether it was wet or whether it was dry. And the ground around, so on, opposite. And interesting, interesting that even Gideon, in a fellow back in the Old Testament days, knew that God spoke through circumstances, but he knew that he couldn't always trust. And so he had that double blind study, the first original double blind study, if you will. Technically, not a double blind study. I, I do know a little bit about that. Uh, dreams and visions, uh, whether it's Daniel, um, or the promise that God in, in the last days would pour out his spirit upon his children. And that uh, young men would, would have dreams and old men would have visions. Uh, these, these are promises in God's word. He does speak to us. I had a dream once of, of I was paddling in a boat with my childhood friend. And on the river was a bunch of bananas. And we were paddling through these bananas. I don't think God was speaking to me in that dream. I think I was hungry. <laughs> Did you ever wake up hungry? Well, maybe, maybe I was hungry. And so your subconscious, which controls your dreams, isn't necessarily God speaking to you. It's 
the circumstances of the day. It's your mind relaxing, unwinding, sometimes putting in different uh, imagery uh, the events of the day or your worries or your cares, right? I've had dreams where God has revealed to me what was going to happen the very next day. You wake up and then it starts to unfold just like in your dream. And that was weird. It doesn't happen a lot to me, but it has happened to me. I get chills right now, running up and down my spine. The hairs on the back of my neck are standing up. You can't see, but it's true. Uh, I've had that experience where God speaks to uh, you in a dream. Perhaps you've had that as well. The Holy Spirit, that still small voice who speaks to us in, in a, a gentle, in the quiet times especially, um, it's a gentle nudging. Sometimes some people say that they hear an audible voice. And I, I have nothing against hearing from God even in an audible voice or a visitation of an angel and so on and so forth. But i uh, got to be honest with you, you can have a tumor. It's not a tumor. Yes, it is. There's a tumor pressing on, you know, some part of your brain that causes you to have these hallucinations. You can be sick and have hallucinations and think that they are visions sent by God. You have to be so careful in this whole list because it's somewhat subjective. But when you come to the Bible, it's in black and white. It is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Is it going to go? Yes. We might want to check into the batteries on this. I don't know. Uh, people believe that God speaks through important uh, people, intellectuals, uh, famous people, uh, rich, powerful people. These are the types of people uh, that they think God is speaking to them through. And why is it always the important, the intelligent, the rich, the famous? Why not the poor, uh, the unknown, uh, the bum on the street corner? I don't know, but frequently, that's sort of like when, when people believe that they're reincarnated, what life did you live previously? Well, previously, I was the king of Persia, or I was the queen of Sitar, or whatever. And, and they have these, these, it's always somebody famous or powerful. No one's ever in the previous life, you know, some, some person who, who was a beggar on a street corner. I don't know why. And that to me, not everyone can be an Antoinette, you know? Not everyone can be Napoleon. Not everyone can be whoever, you know, and it seems as though there are certain ones that always seem to come up. How is it that so many people can be that? Have you ever thought of that? Reincarnation is a lie of Satan. It comes from the devil. It's not in the Bible. It's appointed on the man to live once, and after that comes judgment. You don't get recycled and reused. We do that with our plastic. God doesn't do that with our souls. Well, also is used sometimes newspapers, uh, newscasts, radio commentaries, uh, commentators, and books, etc. All sorts of things people use as a source of knowledge, a source of truth. But what are we learning about these sources of truth? They can't be trusted, can they? This day and age, I think this generation is growing up very confused because who can they trust? These sources that we in our generation, when we were growing up, we trusted, they can't trust them. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, Jesus answered them and said, It is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Uh, this is Jesus' answer to the testing of Satan in the wilderness, and he points to the Word of God. In each and every single one of those three testings, God points to, uh, Jesus points to the Word of God itself uh, that is true when Satan lies to him. It's an important uh, tool to have to defeat temptation, the Word of God. In Proverbs 30, verses 5 through 6, every word of God is flawless. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Uh, do not add to his words, or he will rebuke you and prove you a liar. This is Old Testament and New Testament. God's word should be revered, should be understood to be from him, 
of him and true. You can trust it. You can take it to the bank. I don't know if, if uh, Susan will deposit it in your account or not when you go to her bank, but maybe. I don't know. Matthew chapter 24, verse 35. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Uh, also in the Old Testament. The problem is that people are not perfect, right? They can be wrong. Your professor, your liberal professor who believes in all these things that are of man, he's a humanist, he believes in all sorts of theories that are still unproven, and yet he comes down as authoritative and he's telling you one thing, to believe. Can you truly trust him? What if he's going through uh, a difficult time in his life? What if your pastor is going through a difficult time or some trial or temptation? People go like this with their emotions, their feelings, their opinions, all the time. We vacillate wildly. And it's so important to not be driven about by the wind or by the waves, but to be rock steady sure. And how can we be rock steady sure? You know, our, even our, our message this morning to the children is the importance of God's word. Thank you, Mike, for that. People can't uh, can let you down. They can fail you. They're not perfect. Do not count on your pastor to feed you the truth always. Always check what I'm saying. Whatever any uh, Christian is out there espousing, whether it's uh, somebody that you're reading, somebody on TV, Oh, they're on TV. They have a great worship band. They must know what they're talking about. No, they, they don't always. Circumstances can be misunderstood, even contrived, even by enemies, to make you think that you should be doing or behaving in a certain way. Circumstances, uh, I'm, I'm not much for, for putting out fleeces because I'd have to put out at least two, and then have to be opposite one another. I'd follow Gideon's advice in probably three or four. I don't know, I, I can never be sure enough of anything outside of God's word, I, I truly can't. And so, rather than believing in circumstances, I believe in God, that he will control the circumstances and move me along as if I were in a current in a river, and I will be pushed Gently in one direction or another to stay in his perfect will. Dreams, as I mentioned, they can be part of your subconscious. Uh, demons can, can trick you and say that they're angels with a message from the Lord. And here you are believing, oh, an angel visited me and told me I should, whatever. And here all the time, it wasn't from the Lord, it was a demon telling you to do something sinful, awful, terrible. And there have been people who have been tricked and fooled into such things. You've heard about them. They've been in the news frequently. They're mass murderers and they're on the witness stand. They heard these voices telling them, right? This is what the reality is. This is one thing that can be trusted. These other things, not so much. God can use them. He's used them in my life. But I don't trust them like I trust the Bible. And there's a reason for that. Uh, whenever we put any other source above the Bible, we ourselves are in jeopardy. Our life is in peril. And whenever we place something equal with God's word, we are in tremendous danger. Because there is nothing like this book. The Bible is God's word. And that you can trust. Always. When he says, thou shalt not kill... He means don't go out and kill. It means the same thing. Every year, every generation, since it was first written. It's nice to have something solid to hang your hat on, to know the difference between right and wrong. Those who are trained according to the scriptures are in good stead to be outstanding citizens in our community. To be uh, loyal to their customer base in business and to build a good, sound business model in their community, of which other business owners would, would love to have and emulate. Rallying cry of the Reformation 
was sola scriptura, which means the Bible alone. That was what all the reformers basically were trying to get the Catholic Church to get back to the Word of God, back to the scriptures, because they started adding things. Actually, for many generations, it just didn't start to happen. But there were centuries where there were abuses and things started to get added to uh, the faith that were not in the Bible, but they came from authoritative sources in the church. So we must believe them, right? They got to the point where they were selling indulgences. You could pay money to go to heaven, to have your sins forgiven. You give me enough money, I will absolve you of your sins and you get to go to heaven. Oh my goodness. That was one of the straws that broke the camel's back for Martin Luther and many of the reformers of his day. And they said, no, we will not abide by the teachings of the church. We will abide by the teachings of God's word. Now, I have to tell you, there are teachings, extra biblical teachings that you will get in church, extra biblical uh, suggestions, recommendations. That are, that are good, that are profitable, but they are not on par with Scripture. They are not authoritative like Scripture is. And if anyone says advice to you that goes against something in God's Word, you can't believe it. It's Scripture alone, not anything else. It's not the Bible and something else. The Bible does not have to be validated by another source. It stands alone. And when you put uh, something next to the Bible and say, well, I, I, I'm going to do this because it says in the Bible this, and my pastor says that. No, you don't have to add, and your pastor says that. That's like saying, um, this truck is heavy, and there's a, there's a feather on, on, its, on top of it. The feather doesn't make the truck heavy. The pastor's word is nothing compared to the word of God, nor is the bishop, nor is the pope, nor is Billy Graham. It's all about God's word. Prophecy. Doesn't God speak prophetically through people, through his Holy Spirit, enveloping them and giving them the words to say? A lot of people, let me just teach you a little bit about prophecy. A lot of people believe that prophecy is telling the future. No, that's what the charlatan downtown with the crystal ball does. They lie to you and make up stories about your future, about who you're going to marry or jobs or so on. So a lot of people think that fortune telling is what prophecy is. No, just in case, so that you know and understand, prophecy is truth telling. It's sharing the truth. And that, that might be about the future, but it's not always about the future. If you read the prophets, you'll see that what they were doing were telling people the truth, that their sin would be found out, that they would be punished and held accountable for their sin, a frequent a theme throughout the various uh, prophets, right? Uh, it will not go against scripture. Prophecy never goes against scripture. So if you have somebody claiming to be a prophet, saying something that's not found in God's word, or going against God's word, well, if it's going against God's word, you just shut them down immediately. You turn your back, you run away, you tell others, don't go near that person, they're preaching heresy. They're teaching against the Bible, against God. Um, well, the gift of prophecy, it is not equal to the Bible, but it is a spiritual gift, and some people have it. Uh, many pastors have this gift of prophecy. I don't necessarily claim to have that gift myself, though in the course of teaching of the scriptures to you all, and as I preach, I do have the opportunity to proclaim God's truth to you. So to some extent, I suppose, the gift of prophecy is there in my heart or in my life, but it's not like it is for others who have direct messages uh, for some people or churches or movements, and God speaks to people that way. It is a powerful thing. But we judge whatever message from whatever source by the Bible, right? 
It always comes back to this book. I have to hammer this home, people. You have to be people of the book. It is so crucially important. Otherwise, your faith will vacillate and go about with the winds and the waves. And you don't need that. You don't want that. Let's go over some of the scriptures. In 2 Peter 3.16, we read uh, Peter writing about Paul. Uh, Paul's letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do other scriptures to their own destruction. You know, the whole idea that God is speaking in other ways is nothing new, but it continues in our modern age. And that's why it's made the list as God speaking. They're doing it to their own destruction. Mark 7, 13. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And you do many things like that. Jesus is saying, you know, you put aside God's word all the time. You're doing things that are against God's word because you have these traditions, because you have this heritage, because some so-and-so said so. You should not do those things, he rebukes the people. Uh, Matthew chapter 22, verse 29, Jesus replied, you are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. You don't know how God works. You're making this up. You're controlling and manipulating the people by telling them what they want to hear or sounding authoritative because you raise your voice. Scaring everyone, keeping them under your thumb, all the time not willing to lift a finger to help them. Well, you remember Jesus saying such things against the religious rulers of his day. 1 Corinthians 2, 13, Paul says, this is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit. Explaining spiritual realities with spiritual taught words. God is speaking to us when we read in his Bible. We know that we can trust this book because it has not failed us in the past. In 1 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, verses I would hope that you all know and uh, perhaps would even be able to quote to me, all scripture is God breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work, right? And then uh, a match to it in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 to 21. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will. But prophets, though human, spoke as God, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Proverbs uh, 123, repent at my rebuke. Then I will pour out my thoughts on you. I will make known to you my teachings. Now here we see that God's truth and understanding his truth comes with a humility, comes with repentance. When we are truly sorry for the things that we have done, he comes alongside us and gives us wisdom from above. John 14, uh, verses 23 and 24, Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. In John 8, 31, we read, To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you really are my disciples. There, there, there are many more scriptures. We don't have time. There's only one authoritative source, and it's not you, it's not me, it's not some authority. It's God. It's God speaking to us in his word. You can trust it. The Bible is in its original manuscripts without error. That's what we mean by inerrant. And the doctrine is called inerrancy. We believe in the inerrancy of God's word, that it is without error, that it is whole worthy, trustworthy in its original manuscripts. We don't have the original manuscripts, Pastor. You're right, we don't. But God has protected his word and given us 
as close as possible to the original languages. How do we know this? I don't want to get into it, but there are critical um, studies to show that God's word has not changed. They found, well, I don't want to get into it. Believe me, you can trust even your modern translations, people. It is God's word without error. There are a couple other things that I did want to sh share with you. Uh, all holy books are not written by God. It is only the Bible that's written by God. So whether it's the Book of Mormon or the Talmud or the Quran, don't think that they're on the same level with the scriptures of your Bible. They are not. Uh, they are the inventions of, in most cases, one person. The Bible, as you know, is 66 different works by over 40 different authors uh, written in different languages. Uh, some of these authors were kings and princes and intelligent people, and some were simpletons and shepherds and, and poor folk, you know. Uh, just a plethora of sources and, and uh, languages and regions that they were written in and people that they were written to. Um, maybe it's your, your favorite Christian author, your feelings, your thoughts, your self-proclaimed prophetic utterances, uh, your pastor, your priest, your pope. None of these sources can be trusted always. And I'm sorry if you take offense at that. We can talk. Love me anyway. I still love you. I'm just saying there are some sources that people want to believe always. You always want to believe your mother. If you're a mother, you know you try, but we fail, don't we? I can't think of anyone who would love us more on this earth than a mother. There is only one authoritative source, and that is the Bible. Placing other sources above or equal to the Bible is how many heretical uh, thoughts or teachings come into churches. Teachings like, there is no hell. I don't know where they get that, but in the Bible, it says that there is a hell. Uh, all people go to heaven. Well, I'm sorry. It doesn't say that in the Bible. Some people will go to hell. Uh, troubles are a punishment from God. No, they are not. They're not always the results of God punishing us. Uh, Jesus was just a man. No, in Scripture, clearly, Jesus is more than just a man. You can lose your salvation. No, the Scriptures tell us that the one born from above is God's child. And that which has been given to them will never be taken away. Christ is not coming back. Oh, yes, he is. You are in error. You don't know the word of God. Uh, we should be praying to the saints, for they have God's ear. We have God's ear. You don't have to go to an intermediary. You don't have to go to a middleman uh, when you pray. Go straight to God. Uh, worship Mary or worship the fallen saints. There's no reason to worship them. They are people just as we are. And they may have accomplished great things in faith, and we can appreciate them for that and use them as examples and try to live like them. But to worship them, you shall worship the Lord your God only. Right? This is what the Bible teaches, and yet all these teachings have come into the church, the modern church. If you find yourself attending a church that does not believe that the Bible is the word of God, um, inerrant, that's what I mean by the word of God in its original manuscripts, and the final authority to that which it speaks, you are partaking in a church that is susceptible to heresy. And I don't care how good the worship leader is, how good the worship band is, I don't care how authoritative and good the preacher is. If he's not in God's word, if he's not teaching the truth found and contained in this book, they are leading you down the wrong road. Get out of such a church. Get, I'd rather have you go to a simpleton that has a congregation of four people 
and is as boring as all get up. But they're preaching from the word of God. Because then your soul will not be in jeopardy. You will not be hearing heresy. But the world today, they seem to be content to go to these other sources, thinking that God speaks to them in so many other ways. It's only the Bible, not something. A lot of people say that the Bible contains the words of God. And there's a difference between being the word of God and containing the word of God. They go and they cherry pick. Well, God said this. That, that's from God. And God said this. That's definitely from God. But this part here, that was written by man. And so we'll put that aside. And they cherry pick God's truth. You can make the Bible say anything you want if you have that philosophy, if you have that mentality towards it. And I'm here to tell you, you can't add to it can't take away from it. It's God's truth. Stay in it. 